he suddenly changed all this. An idea came to her, and she put down the knife and got up from the table. I know what I ought to do, she said suddenly. Listen, I can hear. I ought to notify the police force. They will find Charles. I wouldn't do that, said Bernice. Frankie went to the hall telephone and explained to the law about her cat. He's almost pure Persian, she said, but with short hair, a very lovely color of gray with a little white spot on his throat. And he answers to the name of Charles, but if he don't answer to that, he might come if you call him Charlena. My name is Miss F. Jasmine Adams, and the address is 124 Grove Street. Bernice was giggling when she came back, a soft, high giggle. Shoot, they're going to send around here and tie you up and drag you off to Milledgeville. Them fat blue police chasing tomcats around alleys and hollering, oh, Charles, oh, come here, Charlene, I sweet Jesus. Oh, shut up, Frankie said. Bernice was sitting at the table. She had stopped giggling and her dark eye roved in a teasing way as she sloshed coffee into a white china saucer to cool. At the same time, she said, I can't see how it is such a wise idea to trifle around with the law, no matter for what reason. I am not trifling with the law. You just now sit there and spelled them out your name and your house number where they can lay hold of you if ever they take the notion. Well, let them, said Frankie angrily. I don't care. I don't care. And suddenly she did not care if anybody knew she was a criminal or not. Let him come get me for all I care. I was just teasing you, said Bernice. The trouble with you is that you don't have no sense of humor anymore. Maybe I'd be better off in jail. Frankie walked around the table and she could feel them going away. The train was traveling to the north. Mile after mile, they went away, farther and farther away from the town. And as they traveled to the north, a coolness came into the air and dark was falling like the evening dark of wintertime. The train was winding up into the hills, the whistle wailing in a winter tone, and mile after mile they went away. They passed among themselves a box of bought store candy with chocolate set in dainty pleated shells and watched the winter miles pass by the window. Now they had gone a long, long way from town and soon would be in Winter Hill. Sit down, said Bernice. You make me nervous. Suddenly, Frankie began to laugh. She wiped her face with the back of her hand and went back to the table. Did you hear what Jarvis said? What? Frankie laughed and laughed. They were talking about whether to vote for C.P. McDonald, and Jarvis said, Why, I wouldn't vote for that scoundrel if he was running to be the dog catcher. I never heard anything so witty in my life. Bernice did not laugh. Her dark eye glanced down in a corner, quickly saw the joke, and then looked back at Frankie. Bernice wore her pink crepe dress and her hat with the pink plume was on the table. The blue glass eye made the sweat on her dark face look bluish also. Bernice was stroking the hat plume with her hand. And you know what Janice remarked? asked Frankie. When Papa mentioned about how much I've grown, she said she didn't think I looked so terribly big. She said she got the major portion of her growth before she was 13. She did, Bernice. Okay, all right. She said she thought I was a lovely size and would probably not grow any taller. She said all the fashion models and the movie stuff. She did not, said Bernice. I heard her. She only remarked that you probably had already got your growth. But she didn't go on and on like that. To hear you tell it, anybody would think she took her text on the subject. She said, this is a serious fault with you, Frankie. Somebody just makes a loose remark and then you cousin it in your mind until nobody would recognize it. Your Aunt Pet happened to mention to Clorina that you had sweet manners and Clorina passed it on to you for what it was worth. Then, 
Next thing I know, you are going all around and bragging how Mrs. West thought you had the finest manners in town and ought to go to Hollywood, and I don't know what all you didn't say. You keep building on to any little compliment you hear about yourself, or if it's a bad thing, you do the same, you cousin, and change things too much in your own mind, and that is a serious fault. Quit preaching at me, Frankie said. I ain't preaching, it's a solemn truth. I admit it a little, said Frankie finally. She closed her eyes and the kitchen was very quiet. She could feel the beating of her heart and when she spoke, her voice was a whisper. What I need to know is this. Do you think I make a good impression? 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 Yes, said Frankie, her eyes still closed. Well, how would I know, said Bernice. I mean, how did I act? What did I do? Why, you didn't do anything. Nothing? asked Frankie. No, you just watched the pair of them like they was ghosts. Then, when they talked about the wedding, then the ears of yours stiffened out the size of cabbage leaves. Frankie raised her hand to her left ear. They didn't, she said bitterly. Then after a while, she added, someday you're going to look down and find that big fat tongue of yours pulled out by the roots and laying there before you on the table. Then how, how do you think you will feel? Quit talking so rude, said Bernice. Frankie scowled down at the splinter in her foot. She finished cutting it out with the knife and said, that would have hurt anybody else but me. Then she was walking round and round the room again. I am so scared I didn't make a good impression. What of it, said Bernice. I wish Honey and T.T. would come on. You make me nervous. Frankie drew up her left shoulder and bit her lower lip. Then suddenly she sat down and banged her forehead on the table. Come on, said Bernice, don't act like that. But Frankie sat stiff, her face in the crook of her elbow, and her fist clenched tight. Her voice had a ragged and strangled sound. They were so pretty, she was saying. They must have had such a good time. And they went away and left me. Sit up, said Bernice. Behave yourself. They came and went away, she said. They went away and left me with this feeling. Cooey, said Bernice finally. I bet I know something. The kitchen was silent, and she tapped four times with her heel. One, two, three, bang. Her live eye was dark and teasing, and she tapped with her heel and took up the beating with a dark jazz voice that was like a song. Frankie got a crush, Frankie got a crush, Frankie got a crush on the wedding. Quit, said Frankie. Frankie got a crush, Frankie got a crush. Bernice went on and on, and her voice was jazz like the heart that beats in your head when you have a fever. Frankie was dizzy, and she picked up the knife from the kitchen table. You better quit. Bernice stopped very suddenly. The kitchen was suddenly shrunken and quiet. You lay down that knife. Make me. She steadied the end of the handle against her palm and bent the blade slowly. The knife was umber, sharp, and long. Lay it down, devil. But Frankie stood up and took careful aim. Her eyes were narrowed, and the feel of the knife made her hands stop trembling. Just throw it, said Bernice. You just. All the house was very quiet. The empty house seemed to be waiting. And then there was the knife whistle in the air, and the sound the blade made when it struck. The knife hit the middle of the stairway door and shivered there. She watched the knife until it did not shiver any longer. I am the best knife thrower in this town, she said. Bernice, who stood behind her, did not speak. If they would have a contest, I would win. Frankie pulled the knife from the door and laid it on the kitchen table. Then she spat on her palm and rubbed her hands together. 
Bernice said finally, Francis Adams, you gonna do that once too often. I never miss outside of a few inches. You know what your father said about knife throwing in this house. I warned you to quit picking on me. You are not fit to live in a house, said Bernice. Well, I won't be living in this one much longer. I'm gonna run away from home. And good riddance to a big old bad rubbish, said Bernice. You wait and see, I'm leaving town. And where do you think you're going? Frankie looked at all the corners of the room and then said, I don't know. I do, said Bernice. You going crazy, that's where you going. No, said Frankie. She stood very still looking around the queerly pictured wall, and then she closed her eyes. I'm going to Winter Hill. I'm going to the wedding. And I swear to Jesus by my two eyes, I'm never coming back here anymore. She had not been sure that she would throw the knife until it struck and shivered on the stairway door. And she had not known that she would say these words until already they were spoken. The swear was like the sudden knife. She felt it strike in her and tremble. Then when the words were quiet, she said again, after the wedding, I am not coming back. Bernice pushed back the damp bangs of Frankie's hair, and finally she asked, Sugar, you serious? Of course, said Frankie. Do you think I would stand here and swear that swear and tell a story? Sometimes, Bernice, I think it takes you longer to realize the fact than it does anybody who ever lived. But, said Bernice, you say you don't know where you're going. You going, but you don't know where. That don't make no sense to me. Frankie stood looking up and down the four walls of the room. She thought of the world, and it was fast and loose and turning, faster and looser and bigger than ever it had been before. The pictures of the war sprang out and clashed together in her mind. She saw the bright flowered islands and a land by the northern sea with the gray waves on the shore. Bombed eyes and the shuffle of soldiers' feet, tanks and a plane, wing broken, burning and downward falling in a desert sky. The world was cracked by the loud battles and turning a thousand miles a minute. The names of places spun in Frankie's mind China, Peachville, New Zealand, Paris, Cincinnati, Rome. She thought of the huge and turning world until her legs began to tremble and there was sweat on the palms of her hands. But still, she did not know where she should go. Finally, she stopped looking around the four kitchen walls and said to Bernice, I feel just exactly like somebody has peeled all the skin off me. I wish I had some cold, good chocolate ice cream. Bernice had her hands on Frankie's shoulders and was shaking her head and staring with the live eye narrowed into Frankie's face. But every word I told you was the solemn truth, she said. I'm not coming back here after the wedding. There was a sound, and when they turned, they saw that Honey and T.T. T. Williams were standing in the doorway. Honey, though he was her foster brother, did not resemble Bernice, and it was almost as though he came from some foreign country like Cuba or Mexico. He was light-skinned, almost lavender in color, with quiet, narrow eyes like oil and a limber body. Behind the two of them stood T.T. T. Williams, and he was very big and black. He was gray-haired, older even than Bernice, and he wore a church suit with a red badge in the buttonhole. T.T. T. Williams was a beau of Bernice's, a well-off color man who owned a colored restaurant. Honey was a sick loose person. The army would not include him, and he shoveled in a gravel pit until he broke one of his insides and could not do heavy work any more. They stood, the three of them, dark and grouped together in the door. What you all creep up like that for? asked Bernice. I didn't even hear you. You and Frankie too busy discussing something, said T.T. I'm ready to go, said Bernice. I've been ready, but do you wish a small little quickie before we start? T.T. Williams looked at Frankie and shuffled his feet. 
He was very proper, and he liked to please everybody, and he always wanted to do the right thing. Frankie ain't no tattletale, said Bernice. Is you? Frankie would not even answer such a question. Honey wore a dark red rayon slack suit, and she said, That sure is a cute suit you got on, honey. Where'd you get it? Honey could talk like a white school teacher. His lavender lips could move as quick and light as butterflies. But he only answered with a colored word, a dark sound from the throat that can mean anything. Ah, he said. The glasses were before them on the table, and the hair-straightening bottle that held gin, but they did not drink. Bernice said something about Paris, and Frankie had the extra feeling that they were waiting for her to leave. She stood in the door and looked at them. She did not want to go away. You wish water in yours, T.T.? asked Bernice. They were together around the table, and Frankie stood extra in the door alone. So long, you all, she said. Bye, sugar, said Bernice. You forget all that foolishness we was discussing, and if Mr. Adams don't come home by dark, you go on over to the Wests. Go play with John Henry. Since when have I been scared of the dark, said Frankie. So long. So long, they said. She closed the door, but behind her she could hear their voices. With her head against the kitchen door, she could hear the murmuring dark sounds that rose and fell in a gentle way. Ay, ay, ay. And then Honey spoke above the idle wash of voices, and he asked, What was it between you and Frankie when we come in the house? She waited, her ear pressed close against the door to hear what Bernice would say. And finally the words were, Just foolishness. Frankie was carrying on with foolishness. She listened until at last she heard them go away. The empty house was darkening. She and her father were alone at night as Bernice went to her own home directly after supper. Once, they had rented the front bedroom. It was the year after her grandmother died, when Frankie was nine. They rented the front bedroom to Mr. and Mrs. Marlowe. The only thing that Frankie remembered about them was the remark said at the last that they were common people. Yet for the season they were there, Frankie was fascinated by Mr. and Mrs. Marlowe and the front room. She loved to go in when they were away and carefully, lightly meddle with their things. With Mrs. Marlowe's atomizer, which skeeted perfume, the gray-pink powder puff, the wooden shoe trees of Mr. Marlowe. They left mysteriously after an afternoon that Frankie did not understand. It was a summer Sunday, and the hall door of the Marlowe's room was open. She could see only a portion of the room. Part of the dresser and only the footpiece of the bed with Mrs. Marlowe's corset on it. But there was a sound in the quiet room she could not place, and when she stepped over the threshold, she was startled by a sight that, after a single glance, sent her running to the kitchen crying, Mr. Marlowe is having a fit. Bernice had hurried through the hall, but when she looked into the front room, she merely bunched her lips and banged the door, and evidently told her father. For that evening, he said, the Marlows would have to leave. Frankie had tried to question Bernice and find out what was the matter. But Bernice had only said that they were common people and added that with a certain party in the house, they ought at least to know enough to shut a door. Though Frankie knew she was the certain party, still she did not understand. What kind of a fit was it, she asked. But Bernice would only answer, Baby, just a common fit. And Frankie knew from the voice's tones that there was more to it than she was told. Later, she only remembered the Marlowe's as common people, and being common, they owned common things. 
so that long after she had ceased to think about the Marlowe's or Fitz, remembering merely the name and the fact that once they had rented the front bedroom, she associated common people with gray pink powder puffs and perfume atomizers. The front bedroom had not been rented since. Frankie went to the hall hat rack and put on one of her father's hats. She looked at her dark, ugly mug in the mirror. The conversation about the wedding had somehow been wrong. The questions she had asked that afternoon had all been the wrong questions, and Bernice had answered her with jokes. She could not name the feeling in her, and she stood there until dark shadows made her think of ghosts. Frankie went out to the street before the house and looked up into the sky. She stood staring with her fist on her hip and her mouth open. The sky was lavender and slowly darkening. She heard in the neighborhood the sound of evening voices and noticed the light, fresh smell of watered grass. This was the time of the early evening when, since the kitchen was too hot, she would go for a little while outdoors. She practiced knife throwing or sat before the cold drink store in the front yard, or she would go around to the backyard, and there the arbor was cool and dark. She wrote shows, although she had outgrown all of her costumes and was too big to act in them beneath the arbor. This summer, she had written very cold shows, shows about Eskimos and frozen explorers. Then, when night had come, she would go again back into the house. But this evening, Frankie did not have her mind on knives or cold drink stores or shows, nor did she want to stand there staring up into the sky, for her heart asked the old questions, and in the old way of the spring, she was afraid. She felt she needed to think about something ugly and plain, so she turned from the evening sky and stared at her own house. Frankie lived in the ugliest house in town, but now she knew that she would not be living there much longer. The house was empty, dark. Frankie turned and walked to the end of the block and around the corner and down the sidewalk to the wests. John Henry was leaning against the banisters of his front porch with a lighted window behind him so that he looked like a little black paper doll on a piece of yellow paper. Hi, she said. I wonder when that pop of mine is coming home from town. John Henry did not answer. I don't want to go back in that dark, old, ugly house all by myself. She stood on the sidewalk looking at John Henry, and the smart political remark came back to her. She hooked her thumb in the pockets of her pants and asked, If you were going to vote in an election, who would you vote for? John Henry's voice was bright and high in the summer night. I don't know, he said. For instance, would you cast your vote for C.P. McDonald to be mayor of this town? John Henry did not answer. Would you? But she could not get him to talk. There were times when John Henry would not answer anything you said to him. So she had to remark, without an argument behind her, and all by herself like that it did not sound so very smart. Why, I wouldn't vote for him if he was running to be dog catcher. The darkening town was very quiet. For a long time now, her brother and the bride had been at Winter Hill. They had left the town a hundred miles behind them, and now were in a city far away. They were them, and in Winter Hill, together, while she was her, and in the same old town all by herself. The long hundred miles did not make her sadder and make her feel more far away than the knowing that they were them and both together and she was only her and parted from them by herself. And as she sickened with this feeling, a thought and explanation suddenly came to her so that she knew and almost said aloud, they are the we of me. Yesterday and all the 12 years of her life, she had only been Frankie. She was an I person who had to walk around and do things by herself. All other people had a we to claim. All other except her. When Bernice said we, she meant Honey and Big Mama, her lodge or her church. The we of her father was the store. All members of clubs have a we to belong to and talk about. The soldiers in the army can say we 
and even the criminals on chain gangs. But the old Frankie had had no we to claim, unless it would be the terrible summer we of her and John Henry and Bernice, and that was the last we in the world she wanted. Now all this was suddenly over with and changed. There was her brother and the bride, and it was as though when first she saw them something she had known inside of her. They are the we of me. And that was why it made her feel so queer for them to be away in Winter Hill while she was left all by herself. The hull of the old Frankie left there in the town alone. Why are you all bent over like that? John Henry called. I think I have a kind of pain, said Frankie. I must have ate something. John Henry was still standing on the banisters, holding to the post. Listen, she said finally, suppose you come on over here and eat supper and spend the night with me. I can't, he answered. Why? John Henry walked across the banisters, holding out his arms for balance so that he was like a little blackbird against the yellow window light. He did not answer until he safely reached the other post. Just because? Because why? He did not say anything. So she added, I thought maybe me and you could put up my Indian teepee and sleep out in the backyard and have a good time. Still, John Henry did not speak. We're blood first cousins. I entertain you all the time. I've given you so many presents. Quietly, lightly, John Henry walked back across the banisters and then stood looking out at her with his arm around the post again. Sure enough, she called. Why can't you come? At last he said, Because, Frankie, I don't want to. Fool, jackass, she screamed. I only asked you because I thought you looked so ugly and so lonesome. Lightly, John Henry jumped down from the banisters, and his voice as he called back to her was a clear child's voice. Why, I'm not a bit lonesome. Frankie rubbed the wet palms of her hands along the sides of her shorts and said in her mind, Now turn around and take yourself on home. But in spite of this order, she was somehow unable to turn around and go. It was not yet night. Houses along the street were dark. Lights showed in windows. Darkness had gathered in the thick-leaved trees, and shapes in the distance were ragged and gray. But the night was not yet in the sky. I think something is wrong, she said. It is too quiet. I have a peculiar warning in my bones. I bet you a hundred dollars it's going to storm. John Henry watched her from behind the banister. A terrible, terrible dull day storm, or maybe even a cyclone. Frankie stood waiting for the night, and just at that moment, a horn began to play. Somewhere in the town, not far away, a horn began a blues tune. The tune was grieving and low. It was the sad horn of some colored boy, but who he was she did not know. Frankie stood stiff, her head bent, and her eyes closed, listening. There was something about the tune that brought back to her all of the spring. Flowers, the eyes of strangers, rain. The tune was low and dark and sad. Then, all at once, as Frankie listened, the horn danced into a wild jazz spangle that zigzagged upward. At the end of the jazz spangle, the music rattled thin and far away. Then the tune returned to the first blues song, and it was like the telling of that long season of trouble. She stood there on the dark sidewalk, and the drawn tightness of her heart made her knees lock, and her throat felt stiffened. Then, without warning, the thing happened that at first Frankie could not believe. Just at the time when the tune should be laid, the music finished, the horn broke off. All of a sudden, the horn stopped playing. For a moment, Frankie could not take it in. She felt so lost. She whispered finally to John Henry West. He has stopped to bang the spit out of his horn. In a second, 
he will finish. But the music did not come again. The tune was left broken, unfinished, and the drawn tightness she could no longer stand. She felt she must do something wild and sudden that never had been done before. She hit herself on the head with her fist, but that did not help any at all. And she began to talk aloud, although at first she paid no attention to her own words and did not know in advance what she would say. I told Bernice that I was leaving town for good, and she did not believe me. Sometimes I honestly think she is the biggest fool that ever drew breath. She complained aloud, and her voice was fringed and sharp like the edge of a saw. She talked and did not know from one word to the next what she would say. She listened to her own voice, but the words she heard did not make much sense. You try to impress something on a big fool like that, and it's just like talking to a block of cement. I kept on telling and telling and telling her. I told her I had to leave this town for good because it is inevitable. She was not talking to John Henry. She did not see him any more. He had moved from the lighted window, but he was still listening from the porch, and after a while he asked her, Where? Frankie did not answer. She was suddenly very still and quiet, for a new feeling had come to her. The sudden feeling was that she knew deep in her where she would go. She knew, and in another minute the name of the place would come to her. Frankie bit the knuckles of her fist and waited, but she did not hunt for the name of the place and did not think about the turning world. She saw in her mind her brother and the bride and the heart in her was squeezed so hard that Frankie almost felt it break. John Henry was asking in his high child voice, you want me to eat supper and sleep in the teepee with you? She answered, no. You just a little while ago invited me. But she could not argue with John Henry West or answer anything he said, for it was just at that moment that Frankie understood. She knew who she was, and how she was going into the world. Her squeezed heart suddenly opened and divided. Her heart divided like two wings, and when she spoke, her voice was sure. I know where I'm going, she said. He asked her, where? I'm going to Winter Hill, she said. I'm going to the wedding. She waited to give him a chance to say, I already knew that anyhow. Then finally she spoke the sudden truth aloud. I'm going with them. After the wedding at Winter Hill, I'm going off with the two of them to whatever place that they will ever go. I'm going with them. He did not answer. I love the two of them so much. We'll go to every place together. It's like I've known it all my life that I belong to be with them. I love the two of them so much. And having said this, she did not need to wonder and puzzle any more. She opened her eyes, and it was night. The lavender sky had at last grown dark, and there was slanted starlight and twisted shade. Her heart had divided like two wings, and she had never seen a night so beautiful. Frankie stood looking into the sky, for when the old question came to her, the who she was and what she would be in the world and why she was standing there that minute. When the old question came to her, she did not feel hurt and unanswered. At last, she knew just who she was and understood where she was going. She loved her brother and the bride, and she was a member of the wedding. The three of them would go into the world, and they would always be together. And finally, after the scared spring and the crazy summer, she was no more afraid.